friends. So I thought it would be fun to not only do my videos, but also since I recently announced my own pregnancy to do vlog material relating to my pregnancy and this journey and everything. So these will be longer than my five minute birth prep, but it will be kind of just a look into how an OBGYN who knows like the most about pregnancy is managing her own and postpartum and parenting and et cetera. I don't know how often I'll do these. I'm not gonna abide by a schedule. I'm just gonna kind of see where it takes me. So I really wanna talk about this because I think it's been so interesting that during this whole pandemic, one of the most frequent questions I've gotten is how to decide when to try to conceive and make that decision. And little did everyone know that that's a decision I had also been making and going through with my partner, my husband, Michael, um, throughout the spring and then dealing with pregnancy during the pandemic. Again, also something I had a huge part of in the first person experience, but I never shared any of that online. I only shared just like my opinions as a doctor, not any personal commentary. So I'm gonna start way back in the spring. So as those of you who follow me on Instagram know, I'm, Michael and I were planning to get married at the beginning of May with a big traditional wedding, lots of family and friends. We of course canceled that. We did end up getting married with just a few members of our immediate family, less than 10 people, which was gorgeous and wonderful. But in deciding whether or not to get pregnant, um, I'll link my post here where I discuss different things each person should consider, but we went through that process too. So we talked about some of the things that were important to us. Being a parent was really important to both of us. We both always have known we wanted to be parents and wanted that process to start sooner rather than later in terms of our marriage. We also then talked about the risks. I mean, obviously we didn't know much about what this pandemic was gonna be like. We, it of course was very scary. We we're both doctors, so we both knew that we'd have exposures. At the same time, even though we didn't have much data in pregnancy, as an OBGYN, knowing other respiratory viruses, I did suspect that pregnant women would probably be a vulnerable population or group. Um, so those were things that we were cautious about. At the same time, we felt like the pandemic had already kind of taken so much from us and so many of the things that we thought maybe we would do before starting a family, like more traveling. And so we felt like we didn't want to wait for this joy. In addition, I'm the type of person who generally manages situations about the unknown and manages anxiety pretty well. I'm pretty good about being in the moment. If I feel anxious, being able to kind of like manage my anxiety. And so I knew that a lot of the unknowns around like COVID and pregnancy, I thought that I'd be able to handle those. I'm an overall healthy person, although even though COVID can make lots of healthy people really sick, I knew that just that for me, I didn't have additional risk factors for either pregnancy um, going into it. So that's how we made the decision about trying to conceive after our marriage in the spring. I'll also kind of share what that was like. So I had started taking prenatal vitamins a few months before knowing that we'd probably try to conceive within the first few months of being married. I share this all the time on my Instagram, so it's like not a secret. I have loved my hormonal IUD for many, many years. I had a hormonal IUD for about seven and a half or eight years. And I, don't usually get periods, maybe once or a year or so, but I can tell just from like paying attention to my body, usually where I am in my cycle in a rough estimate. So when I removed my IUD, I was like, I maybe should get a period in two weeks. But here's the other thing about being an OBGYN. You can kind of like, well, actually anyone can do this. And I have tons of posts on my Instagram about the menstrual cycle, so you can do this too. I'll link them all in the show notes. But basically I took out my IUD around the time I thought I was ovulating. So I thought maybe I'll get a period in two weeks. Well, I didn't get a period. And I think that was because the IUD contains progesterone, which thins the endometrial lining, and I had had mine for many years. And so I took my IUD out at the end of the time when your uterus would build up an endometrial lining to shed it. So with the IUD, it probably had never built up that lining. So I think that's why I didn't get a bleeding from a period because the endometrial lining had never built up. So I was like, okay, well, that's not super abnormal. Um, and so just kind of like went about my time and I kind of thought uh, around the, you know, two weeks later again, I was like, this is probably around the time that I'm ovulating. Maybe again, we were just kind of seeing what happened. So I was not taking ovulation prediction kits or, um, tracking anything like my temperature or anything like that to find out when I was ovulating. I was just kind of guesstimating like, oh, it's probably around this week or so. 
And so then I was expecting a period in another two weeks. So this is now a month and a half after taking out my IUD. And I wasn't getting my period and I was like, okay, well it could be like any time this week or maybe 10 days, like I could be kind of off, but whatever. But you know, it was pandemic time and you know, we were newlyweds. So I was like drinking a good amount of wine and Michael got into making really fun cocktails. So, you know, we don't drink every night, but more than just the weekend maybe. So I was taking pregnancy tests before we had planned to like have a cocktail or something just to be sure. And one night I took a pregnancy test and it was negative and I was like, okay, great. And we had had wine that night. And then the next day I had used my favorite pregnancy test which are, because they're so cheap and affordable, especially if you're like not sure when you're testing. And I had been just testing to make sure I wasn't pregnant before drinking. But I was like, I'm having trouble like seeing a line on these. Like what if these tests are so affordable? What if they're cheap? Maybe I should go get like one of those real tests. <laughs> so I went to like Walgreens and got like one of the more expensive tests, which are so expensive. They're like $7 for two tests. That's ridiculous. That's why I like the other ones. But I took that real test and I saw like a really faint line and I took one of the cheap tests and then I also saw a faint line. So it was the first time that I had seen faint lines and they were on both tests, both the ones that I thought were cheaper, like are these working and on that other one. So the cheap ones were fine. It just wasn't time yet. I saw a really faint line and I was super excited. Of course I knew it was so, so early. I didn't even know exact dates. Cause like I said, I hadn't really been keeping track. So I thought up a little plan to tell Michael, but you know what? That little plan, it went off really cute. It was just a little thing I threw together in a few hours. But Michael has decided that that's a secret and that that's something that we share. So I'm actually not going to share how I told Michael that I was pregnant. I'll, I'm going to share how I told my mom though, but I'll get to that in a second. All right, back from a little vacation. I think the other big question that I know I'm going to get a lot of announcing my pregnancy at 25 weeks is why I picked to share it a lot later than other people. But I want to clarify that I didn't share it like publicly until that time but my close family and friends knew and then we started to tell our families and like as an OBGYN when I have patients ask like when should we tell our families about our pregnancy or family or friends or whoever I really think it's an individual choice you know I think it's customary not to tell people that you're pregnant until the end of the first trimester and that's because of the risks of miscarriage or the risk of a genetic anomaly that's found during first trimester genetic screening. So I think that influences people's choice that they may, may want to keep that private information if in case something goes wrong. But on the total flip side of that, I encourage people to share who would be comfortable sharing that they may have had a miscarriage um, or something go wrong. So if you want to share with someone who you feel really comfortable also supporting you through something like a miscarriage, then it's totally fine to tell them whenever you guys feel comfortable. With social media, there's of course drawbacks and advantages to how much people share, but I really do see a really big benefit in people sharing their stories about their miscarriages and pregnancy loss. October is Pregnancy Loss Awareness Month. We saw Chrissy Teigen and John Legend share their second trimester loss, something that's less common, but often not talked about. So I think it's can be empowering for people to share about their miscarriages. But at the same time, if that's not you and you wanna keep it private, that's totally fine. For us, we just started telling people when it like felt natural to tell people. We waited a few weeks into the pregnancy and then, you know, it was quarantine. So we weren't seeing a lot of people. We told um, people as it, as it came up, as we were on a Zoom happy hour um, with friends or as it kind of, became a good time like with family. Ideally, we wanted to tell family in person and that wasn't quite possible for a lot of our family, unfortunately. I was able to tell my mom in person and I'm gonna share that video because I love it so much. Usually, I feel like people get to share in person more frequently, but because Michael and I live, don't live with our families and with all of the travel restrictions and quarantine and just trying to stay safe for ourselves, we didn't get to. So the fact that I was able to tell my mom in person is really special and here's the video for that. So I don't know where you should eat for lunch, but there is someone I want you to meet. Funds from police departments to social services. Open the Governor Murphy, where do you stand on that issue when it comes to police funding in the state of New Jersey? Yeah, so we have had... I knew it. I knew it. I knew that's why you wanted me to come. I knew it. I knew it. Oh my God. So um, as for telling other people, um, there's another kind of thought about it too. The anatomy scan is between 18 to 22 weeks. Um, you can talk to your doctor about 
when they typically do it, which might depend on scheduling or your individual history and things like that. Um, but the anatomy scan can identify big, major fetal anomalies that may be incompatible with life, but they aren't recognized on earlier testing or ultrasounds. Those can be catastrophic events, obviously, not to be super Debbie Downer, but as an OBGYN, I see it all. So for kind of people that weren't in our immediate circle or that we didn't see a lot, we shared the news after that, after everything looked okay on the anatomy scan. So then it was kind of like that second circle of people we knew in real life, and then it just became like my public social media circle. And I think part of the reason I didn't share was kind of trivial. One, I wanted to get my website up. I wanted to get started on YouTube. But other reasons were that even though I have a lot, I'm blogging, like I just told you a bunch of personal information, and I share a lot on Instagram too, I am also a private person. And in my job, I do see a lot of major complications with pregnancy. And so honestly, I thought really hard about why I didn't feel like sharing. And I, I kept putting it off, to be totally honest. I thought, oh, I'll probably share online. I used to think I was going to share before the anatomy scan. Decided not to, really wanted to wait for that. Had that thought, well, I'll share soon, but like wouldn't set a date in my mind. And it's hard for me to understand if it's because of my job and all of the kind of pregnancy loss I see and difficulties I see, or if it was just an attempt at during this weird time of COVID and pregnancy that like focusing on my own special joy was like super comforting just to like have this little beautiful secret. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but definitely all of those things contributed to it. So I think that's why we had waited so long to share. I'll share other things about my pregnancy, like my first trimester must-haves. I'm into the second trimester now, so my experiences with that, either on the blog, on the Instagram, or on YouTube, I'm not quite sure, but most of my content is just pure educational content that helps you figure out your life, your reproductive health, and your pregnancy and birth. So here on YouTube, we talk about birth and pregnancy, but over on Instagram, I talk about birth control and periods and breastfeeding and postpartum and like lots of other things too. So be sure you follow me on Instagram and don't forget to subscribe here to YouTube. Every Friday I have an informational video about birth. This week we're gonna cover COVID and labor and delivery. As many of you know, I'm a general OBGYN and I'm board certified to do full scope OBGYN, but right now I practice exclusively working on labor and delivery. And so I've really seen the progression over the last six months and I wanna empower you guys with information about good questions to ask your doctors and things that you may be thinking about as you approach pregnancy and birth during this time. It doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for joining me. Please comment. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to say hi, like this video and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.